Hello, I'm Gary Johnson. Today is the 13th of July and we're at the Chicago History Museum. Could you please uh, give us your name for the record? Dick Simpson. Simpson. And <coughs> preliminary question, have you ever given any oral histories before? And if you have, where could a scholar find them? Well, the only one that's actually an oral history was printed in Milton Rakoff's book. Uh, I believe it's uh, uh, don't Make No Waves, Don't Back No Losers from Indiana, you know, uh, from Bloomington, Indiana. I think it was then Bob's, Mer uh, it's Indiana University Press. The, uh, however, my papers are in, uh, in the special collections at the Daly Library at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And along with those papers are uh, items that are from uh, radio interviews and TV interviews. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, when was the first time that you met uh, Mayor Richard J. Daley? Well, I'm not sure you could call it exactly meeting. Um, the first time I would have actually uh, been with Mayor Daley in person was when I was sworn in as alderman uh, in about April of 1971. I think it was the 21st. It's usually about the 21st or 22nd of April. Um, and the entire new city council was sworn in. The mayor was presiding, if I remember right. Now, you were elected as an independent. Uh, what was the greeting like when, when? Well, there was no greeting. He just called the meeting to order. Um, uh, even though I became maybe the mayor's principal opponent in later years, um, uh, we didn't have uh, private meetings or private conversations. I think. Um, I spoke to him once or twice. I remember in 1975, um, I had supported Bill Singer's election for mayor, and uh, the first city council meeting after that, um, uh, in the back of the city council chamber, there's a, an entryway that aldermen and mayors use, and I congratulated the mayor on his campaign victory. Um, we had many... Um, uh, discussions and confrontations and other events that all happened on the city council floor. Uh, unfortunately, Channel 11 for many years videotaped the city council um, and uh, then they destroyed the videotape so they could put an Adlai Stevenson Senate bank hearing on air. They ran out of tape and so at least one or two years of full footage of the council were destroyed by Channel 11. Um, there are, of course, many clips, audio and video, of uh, the public gatherings and uh, many newspaper articles. Um, probably the biggest set of early confrontations was not too long after I was alderman uh, when I opposed the mayor's uh, appointment of Tom King Jr. to the Zoning Board of Appeals on the grounds of nepotism. Um, and. Uh, we had had a series of run-ins. Uh, soon afterwards, uh, he also, it turned out that he'd also given receiverships and insurance contracts to his sons. And so there was a running dialogue um, from, uh, oh, maybe June of 71 to at least uh, the fall of that year in every council meeting, some issue related to nepotism or patronage or one of those topics. Uh, was uh, subject to major confrontation between the mayor and I when he was there or the president pro tem if the mayor wasn't in the chair. <coughs> now let's, let, let's go back to that uh, incident. Thomas Keene, the father of course, was, was the very powerful chair of the finance committee. We separately did an interview with Jack Guthman who mm -hmm. also brought up the events with the appointment of uh, Keene's son. Do I, do I have it Right. The original idea was that he was going to be appointed and eventually become the chairman, but he wound up being appointed as a member but never became the chairman, as I remember. As I remember, he was only a member. I don't uh, think Jack did become chairman, of course. Uh, I think he and Tom were appointed very similar time period. I can't tell you which month. They weren't the same appointment. Um, uh, you know, there was a double conflict of interest with Tom King Jr. It wasn't just that his father was the uh, straw boss of the city council. 
um, what you might call the mayor's floor leader, besides being chair of the finance committee. But uh, Tom Keene Jr. was the vice president of Arthur Rubloff Company. Arthur Rubloff Company was at the time the biggest real estate developer in Chicago. And so you were putting, the mayor was suggesting to put on the Zoning Board of Appeals the vice president of a real estate company whose direct profit would depend on some decisions of the Zoning Board of Appeals, or at least potentially could. And even if they didn't, it would be very likely that as vice president of Rubloff, he would have uh, dealings with other people who had cases. So it was a built-in conflict of interest um, in terms of the, um, the business elite, or particularly the developer elite in Chicago, as well as the political conflict of being the son of Tom Keene, Sr. Now, you must have known when you raised uh, that issue, for example, one, one of your first, that you didn't have the votes. Uh, no, we never had defeated. the votes. <clears throat> we often were defeated. Um, the way we saw our role at the time, or at least I saw my role and some of the others saw their role this way. Um, I came out of the civil rights movement. I had been uh, part of uh, the, I had been campaign manager for Eugene McCarthy. I saw my role as laying a groundwork for a different kind of future for the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was really an ideological or future of the city conflict. And the individual issues that came up were part of that. We weren't going to have the votes to defeat. In fact, the final vote, if I remember right, was 44 to 2. I think it was Bill Singer who joined me in the opposition on that particular issue. Um, but that you can look up in the journal. The, um, so it, and actually, it was interesting. I didn't give a huge long speech. I really was asking a question uh, of if this was a proper appointment. And uh, those words are recorded, uh, both in my rogues book and actually from Studs Terkel's tape, uh, which he got from Bill Cameron, who was the radio reporter for WMAQ, mm -hmm. who happened to tape that part of the council meeting. Um, so you could actually hear, Bob Crawford has it as well, uh, you could actually hear the very short speech I made, two or three sentences, and uh, then the responses, first from the alderman and then later from the mayor. What was the mayor's response? Uh, he gave a very uh, long, uh, disconnected tirade. It was, um, in a, he was very red in the face. Uh, some people feared he was gonna have his stroke then. Uh, he was so upset. And um, it wasn't clear why he was so upset. Why, why, I mean, this is a minor appointment. It's an important board. It's only one member. Um, he clearly had the votes. There'd already been five or six of the machine aldermen speak uh, about how terrible it was I was opposing this nice boy. Um, and uh, so it wasn't clear. Why was he so upset? And it came clear as the months went on immediately afterwards that nepotism was an issue that hit very close to home for Daly because at that point uh, he was giving these contracts to his sons and uh, more than that, he felt he had to really defend Tom Keene. Um, Keene didn't do a rebuttal. Um, and uh, Daly wanted to sort of assure the members of the party that, that they, they would still get his support if they app appointed to their staff, their son or their nephew or whatever. Uh, it was part of the machine way. And it was so. It was something that went to the heart of what Daly thought was the proper form of politics uh, that he had grown up with. And he thought it was motherhood and apple pie. Um, as the newspaper accounts indicated, um, as the controversy spiraled, uh, there were a lot of people in Chicago that didn't think that. And the reason they didn't was because if uh, the politicians in power only appointed their family members or their friends, uh, that meant that every other person in Chicago wasn't going to get a city job or wasn't going to get an important appointment or wasn't going to get a city contract, that you had to be clouded in, that you had to be part of the party or the party supporters. And um, that was something people could rally around. That was something they could, you didn't have to make a long explanation of why this appointment of Tom Keene Jr. was symbolic 
of many other things that they immediately understood and they knew was true. You didn't have to prove this was nepotism or you didn't have to prove nepotism was bad. It, uh, it easily became uh, a point that, that everyone could understand and you took up sides on. And that was one of the things that we were trying to do was to try and say there's a different way of running the city and patronage and nepotism need to not be part of that new way. Now, when, when you say we, th there were a few other members of, of the opposition group, and I, I, have a, I have a list of them here, and so, um, they're not around to give their own oral history, so I'd appreciate it if you A few you of them little, are. Few of the, well, let me, let, me just, let me just run through the list I have here. And they weren't all in the, in the council at the same moment. Anna Langford. Well, let me give you the list the other way. Okay. Will, uh, the list as of 71, okay, because it good. does, um, and I may miss one or two. Um, in the 71 council, among the black aldermen, there was only Anna Langford and Bill Cousins. Bill Cousins had been there before. Anna had just come on. Among the white aldermen, there was Linda Prey, of course, from the fifth ward. Uh, there was Bill Singer and I. Uh, and I'm still missing their... Um, well, Seymour Simon... Well, yeah, was, then what you had... So you had sort of a hardcore of five to seven. Right. And then you had an additional group of seven. The other two that were our allies, surprisingly enough, that I would count in the first seven were John Holland, a Republican, right. and even more surprising, Father Lawler, Right. who was a very conservative Catholic priest from the southwest side of Chicago. We made up essentially the inner seven of opposition. Seymour Simon was a dissident Democrat who uh, became more and more in the opposition. He had been dumped by Daley and others from his position as county board president. Had always been something of a maverick. Um, so Seymour would join us on some things. And then we had a couple of other, we had Ed Scholl, who was a Republican, who later was unfortunately indicted uh, and convicted of uh, corruption. Um, and then th there were people who talked uh, what we would call the young Turks in the machine, but we could never get their votes. They included people like Chris Cohen, Cliff Kelly, but they weren't independents. And uh, on a women's issue, we might get Mary Lou Headland. We would pick up Mm -hmm. votes from around the council. We were never able in the 71 to 75 period to get more than 14. Um, and the motives obviously were different uh, in the general sense. Um, our definition, which we used as a joke, or I did anyway, uh, was uh, anyone was our ally who didn't believe the mayor was omnipotent. Uh, that is, who didn't really have firm allegiance to the mayor and would do whatever the mayor said do. And uh, um, there were other people like uh, Verdoliak and Burke uh, that were in the Young Turks, but they wouldn't quite break with the mayor. And the same was true, as I say, with more like the Cliff Kelly type who were um, much more sympathetic, but we could almost never get their vote. I remember the, the, the term, the coffee club, to describe the, the Burke circle. The, yeah, it was called the Coffee Rebellion. I think it happened in 73. It was fairly early. <clears throat> and after, again, what we were doing was building a base of opposition based on issues. Uh, 